Mr. Bermuda Shorts, how are you? Good. How are you doing, Daryl? I'm good. I'm in I'm in uh, sunny Las Vegas in my fake studio here. Uh, <laughs> where Where are you these days? Are you in Los Angeles? Uh yeah, here in L.A. Uh, I'm in a in a uh, I'm a little bit drunk, so things are very blurry right now. <laughs> that's a, uh, as they should be. <laughs> oh no, that's a Zoom setting. Never mind. No, that's that's so you don't see all the crap in in my office here. So. Well, it's the same, same for me. Uh, you guys, you know, you're, you've been uh, partners in crime with Weird Al Yankovic um, for decades now. I mean, it's actually over four decades. And it's such an interesting story because we were talking about before we started that you guys have such a long, enduring partnership. And it's a story that some people know, but a lot of people don't know. So tell me how originally, well, first, let's start with how you started drumming, because that's also a cool story with, with Ludwig and, and all that. Well, I, I started, uh, well, there's with, with every, with every answer, there's like three or four backstories that go with it. Let me, let me explain first that, uh, we lived in Chicago. My father was in advertising, uh, in Chicago and in the fifties, late fifties. And, uh, my brother, uh, who's five years older than me, uh, my dad had done some kind of a, of an ad with Ludwig and I don't, uh, and for whatever reason, I never asked my dad before he passed. I never asked anybody at Ludwig, can you go back to the late fifties and see if you could find my dad? I never figured out what it was that he worked on, but instead of getting paid, he bartered uh, a, a snare drum for, uh, for his oldest son, for my older brother. And uh, so, uh, you know, Bill Ludwig Jr. happily agreed, you know, to, to do that, to cough up a snare that was probably worth 60 bucks at the time, <laughs> you know, yeah. and a stand and a, a book and a record and a, and a pair of sticks and some brushes and a practice pad. I mean, a whole snare drum outfit. And awesome. uh, and uh, my dad, in turn, bought, added to the drums, bought a bass drum and a, a mounted tom on it. So there was a three-piece kit, a hi-hat stand and all that. And uh, my brother began taking drum lessons in Chicago. Well, we moved to Phoenix. Uh, when I was about uh, eight or so, I began taking accordion lessons, of all things. <laughs> and uh, my brother, in, in the meantime, had switched to guitar. So there was a set of drums in the house. And I guess I must have got tired of the accordion and thought, you know, there's no future in that. Who's going to listen to an accordion player? It's going to be hard to pick uh, up chicks. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's never going to, you know. So... Uh, I uh, I switched to the drums. We we moved the drums from his room across the hall to my room. I started taking drum lessons right after my ninth birthday. This is in Phoenix, and uh, continued. Uh, you know, we moved to Los Angeles when I was eleven or twelve, and and we uh, I was in school bands and marching bands and stuff like that. And and uh, that's kind of that's the seed of how the drums came to be. And they were Ludwig drums, having come from Ludwig at the time. I got a brand new set in 1969, also Ludwig. Uh, awesome. You know, there there wasn't a proliferation of all of these incredible brands out there. There were a key four or five brands, Slingerland, right. Rogers, Camco, uh, Gretsch, Ludwig. That was kind of it. And then a whole series of made in Japan brands, which were made alternately by the, the Pearl Corporation or uh, Hoshino, Tama. Right. And they each had uh, a whole series of just these impossible long list of of names of, uh, of <laughs> made in Japan drums. Some of them were quite good. Hardware wasn't great, but the shells were quite good. I mean, a lot of studio guys in the 80s and 90s had kind of rediscovered those and uh, were using secretly using those in the studio. Yeah, so. I'm actually, so I actually, I'm a bass player, but I'm, I also have a drum corps background. I was in the Velvet Knights in California. Oh, sure. Back, Yeah, so back in the early 80s, like 80 to 80, whatever. So I, I'm really familiar with the whole drum thing. And Yeah, go and VKs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> oh, cool. that's, 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 so we have a, we have a similar thing with that. Um, So you're, so you're in LA, this, I guess this would be like 60s, 70s, you're, you're bouncing around playing in bands. Um, Tell me how that was. That must have been such, such an exciting time to be doing that, the club scene there. Well, I got into the club scene, I guess, in the late 70s, you know, by the time I was old enough to get into clubs. Or, right. Uh, and uh, and and actually started having bands and things like that. Uh, the club scene was was great. New Wave was was happening at the time. Rockabilly was just about coming up. And I was in, uh, I've always been like in two or three bands at once. And uh, some of these bands I'm still in. Uh, I, I've been working with a guy named Rip awesome. Masters, who's been doing Americana and Rockabilly and country and stuff. And I've been with him since 1981. Wow. Second only to Al in, yeah, in terms say, of longevity. And, and as we know, bands, that's unheard of for most oh, bands yeah. to be together that long. Awesome. Yeah, well, most, most artists don't hang in there that long, let alone right. keep the same guys around them. And that, exactly. is, that is really rare. 
uh, and I've and some of the other current bands I'm in, I, I've been in for 12, 15, 20 years. And uh, and I occasionally sub with some other bands and stuff like that. But I mean, I've always been in multiple bands concurrent uh, with Al starting in late 1980 when I met Al. Uh, I've always done these other bands in between whatever is happening with Al. Now, obviously, for obvious reasons, he he takes precedence and all the bands know that. And yeah. uh, they get if we're going on the road or something, they get plenty of notice and, and they bring in a sub and they always have me come back, which is uh, which I'm very grateful for, because I really enjoy working with these bands. Yeah, that, that's a good side when they ask you back, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, and, the, and it's not that the subs aren't any good, and it's not that they just really, you know, the, the, I, I had one one band say, uh, and I lined them up with the sub, and and they said, you know, uh, he was he was all right. I said, well, what was wrong? Did he not play the right parts? Oh no, no, he played the right parts. Did he was his timing good? Oh, he has great time. Was he a nice guy? No, he's a great guy. I said, well, yeah. what's what's wrong? He's, they said he's not you. Yeah, and that's you know what, and that's Which is the nice. Thing. Right, exactly. Because that's the thing as a musician, like you want to have your own voice. And that's a good that speaks to that, where where everybody and you get to a certain level, especially in Los Angeles, there's a certain level where everybody's great players, then it just becomes whatever the vibe is. And, and there's so much more than just playing as we know. Um, yeah. So, so let's get to Al. So how, how did that I mean, I kind of know that story. But so you, um, you guys were both sort of involved in the, the Dr. Demento story and which i and who i used to listen to when i was i guess high school maybe <laughs> early high school there there was uh well we were both we were both it's funny we you know we both were listening you know all the cool kids or all the nerdy kids i guess in junior high and high school listen to yeah. dr demento that was me and, well, and, and me too <laughs> me too and uh and he and i both sort of dove in and uh, quite separately from each other but both dove in at a, a specific moment in time this was early 1973 and and the doctor was running a contest. He wanted uh, there was a song called Pico and Sepulveda, which got was always the number one requested song on the show, and it just got sort of old and obvious. And so he said, "You know what? We're gonna we're gonna pull the song. I want you guys out there that have bands or whatever you do to record your own version of Pico and Sepulveda. We'll have a contest, and the winner gets uh, a seventy eight RPM record of Felix Figueroa's Pico and Sepulveda." You know, they get they get my copy of that record. Awesome. And and uh, so it again, independent of each other, Al and some of his buddies sent in a recording. But there's there's more to a story. But that was like his first foray into the Demento area. And then some friends of mine, uh, you know, and, and again, in school bands at that time, there were no guitars or even bass players or, uh, you know, they were all horn players. So these right. were all all my buddies from the school band. And I had I had. Quite a, a couple of very well-known guys on there. A guy named uh, uh, Richard Elliott on saxophone. Sure. Yeah. Well, well-known sax player. Uh, a guy named Barry Keys on trombone, who I believe wound up in the Tonight Show band. Awesome. A guy named Jeff Rona, who I was actually in a band with. Jeff played flute on this recording, but he also he later played keyboard. Uh, he worked with Roland, and he was on the committee that invented MIDI. Oh well, that's a good place to be. Uh, um, uh, not and not not his necessarily his biggest claim to fame. I mean, he's he's uh, uh, recorded and scored a bunch of TV show stuff, and just he's very well known in the business. I'm sure he doesn't touch the flute anymore, but yeah, he he's awesome. very well known composer, uh, and uh, not in a musical related way, but uh, another trombone player in there ended up uh, as one of the top anesthesiologists in Los Angeles. In fact, I think he's on the board of anesthesiologists. It's for, always he over. Overachieving yeah. trombone players. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And I remember, I remember one time I said, uh, "You're an anesthet. Do you you put people to sleep?" He says, "No, I wake them up." Yeah, so, exactly. Very, very <laughs> clever. That's that's the money. Anyway, and, so, anyway. Cool. So this is the very first. So early April, nineteen seventy three. Let's say, uh, I think it was April. Was was the time we both sort of jumped in. Uh, never heard his recording his version of the song, none of the guys involved apparently ever kept, you know, you'd made a cassette and then you sent it in. You didn't keep a copy. Not me. I made a recording and I sent a copy of it and I kept the master. Uh, so we, we both, he didn't en end up sending it in. He ended up uh, seeing Dr. Demento talk at his high school and he handed him a, the cassette. He says, this is for the Pico and Spolpita contest. And Dr. Demento evidently didn't have the heart to tell him that he'd missed the deadline and the tape wound up in Demento's trunk, and then he sold the car. So that recording is is <laughs> at literally, and I know the guys who played on it, and nobody's got a copy. It's gone forever, uh, except for the guy that owns that car. He may not realize what gold 
what jam he has in his truck. <laughs> right. Now, the recording that, that me and my friend sent in, we got second place in the contest. So we got played the night he announced the 10 top winners. And I didn't know beforehand. I mean, I just uh, tuned in right. and heard it heard it coming up and it's like oh boy you know so i actually got uh, some uh, 45s that were signed by dr demento and stuff like that but he he uh used our song we did an instrumental of it we did there's a vocal intro pico and sepulveda and then harmonies pico and sepulveda pico and sepulveda and then this kind of bad horn marching band thing and it just <laughs> instrumental from so he used it for the theme for his show because he could talk over it because there weren't any vocals conflicting oh, with it. Oh, awesome. So that was kind of cool. So we thought, wow, we're, you know, this, we, you know, one, we came in pretty high in the contest. Two, we're getting played a lot. Let's record another song, send it in, which we did the following January 1st, January 1st, 1974. Uh, we recorded the Ballad of Woodsy Owl, sent that in. He played that. Uh, we weren't so, and, and some of the same guys uh, who, who had done the Pico and Sepulveda as well. And a little more time went by, middle of 75, we sent in another recording, did another recording called uh, Mr. Ghost Goes to Town. And this was a a uh, sort of a combination of two versions of the songs from the 30s that he played uh, mm -hmm. on his show, usually around Halloween. And he played our version. In fact, we wow. still get played around Halloween now and then. So <laughs> this is pretty cool. So we're like sending in homemade stuff at a time when nobody's doing that yet. Yeah. Uh, well... A little later on, summer of 1980, I guess, uh, I got an invitation to come down to the show uh, through my brother, who worked with a guy who uh, knew Dr. Demento, and thought, oh, it'd be very cool to, if you guys want to see him do a show live here in L.A. It was on KMET. He right. did a live show Sunday nights. I was also syndicated. A version of that show went out to stations across the country, and and uh, about two to three weeks after that show was done, elements from that were compiled into another show for syndication. Uh, so we went down, and and by this time, a lot of people, including Weird Al, were sending in homemade music to the show. The 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 theme of the show had changed a little bit, and it was catering more towards homemade comedy music or novelty right. music. And so Al was already well known on the show at this time. So uh, my brother and I went down there and and got to meet Doctor Demento, of course, for the first time. And the doctor asked if I'd like to come back and do an interview and talk about the stuff I had sent in, you know, now several years before, and whatever stuff I was working on at the time. And I was in a band called Nipper at the time, and we were doing all the LA clubs, Club eighty eight, Madame Wong's, and stuff like that. Right, all the all the places, yeah. Right, right. So, uh, came down September fourteenth, nineteen eighty, and uh, Al was there. And Al and a lot of the other uh, cast members, Musical Mike and and Sulu and Jovial Joan, uh, were there answering phones and just kind of providing all sorts of weirdness. Sometimes Al would play something live on the air, but you know he was there to answer phones. They'd, he'd, they'd get him to read a PSA now and then. I mean, just he was one just of the cast having, characters. Having fun and yeah, yeah. Exactly. But but you know was also a requested artist on the show. Anyway, so I was there uh, doing the interview, and and Al was going to debut a song he had just written that weekend uh, live on the air called Another One Rides the Bus, which is Queen's Another One Bites the Dust. Now, yeah. again, Al plays accordion, and there's usually noisemakers and people clapping and people hooping and hollering and singing in the background. So Al had asked, uh, he actually asked another buddy of his, Beefalo Bill, if he would pound on on Al's accordion case and provide a beat. And I and, and Bill was kind of hesitant to do that. And I I got roped into it somehow. I don't know if Al asked me or if or if Bill asked me or whatever. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. That's fine. That's cool. So we we played the song uh, and uh, Demento recorded it. Now, he usually did an air check on a cassette of the entire show just so he'd have a record of the show. Right. But this time he rolled like, like just quarter inch like stereo tape on it. Oh, just wow. for whatever reason, he recorded it on a separate machine, which turned out to be a good move because that became a single. That's what ended up on the first album later on. Anyway, so we finished the the thing, and uh, uh, and I said to Al, you know, folklore. The rumor is, I said, you know, you know, you should have a band. I'll be your drummer, which sounds like something I would say. Don't know what made me think that. I mean, I didn't envision forty plus years of success, yeah. you know, and and uh, it's just something I said. It just seemed like fun. I had a day job at the time. I was already playing in another band, so my my drumming needs were basically fulfilled. And uh, so Al and I swapped phone numbers. Anyway, he was in school at the time up in San Luis Obispo, kind of Central California-ish. And uh, he called me a couple of weeks later, about three weeks later. He says, you know that another one rides the bus thing we did ended up on the syndicated show that played this last Sunday night. And in a lot of the markets, 
where they had, you know, and the, and the show usually aired on a Sunday night in all the right. different markets. He had, a, he had a huge following. Oh, yeah. And it, it aired on, on like almost 200 stations across the country. And Al says, you know, a lot of these these morning zoo DJs will listen to the Demento show and find funny stuff to play in their morning show. He says they're playing. There's a bunch of markets are playing. Another one rides the bus in drive time now. <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty, you know, guy, people are in their cars that's, locked that's in. That's the money. Yeah, right and there. <laughs> that's, that's where you get known. I mean, that's yeah. where you get heard. Yeah. So, so he says, uh, I got myself a man. He, he, he was right on it. He said, I got a manager. I'm going to be home in uh, January. I'm re I want to record a couple of things and uh, put this out and, and put out a, a single and, and put it in some stores and, you know, and, and kind of go from there. I said, okay, I'm there. So uh, he came back in January. We recorded uh our first of three versions uh, over the years of Happy Birthday. Uh, another one rides the bus ended up on there. He had a couple of more things that he already had in the can. And we put put out a four-song EP uh, that that was commonly known as the Placebo EP because he had it on the Placebo label, you know, generic <laughs> label. Yeah, right. And and they pressed up a thousand of those. And he and Dr. Demento came over to my house uh, after they got all the stuff together. They had the records in sleeves. They had made a uh, an outer sleeve that was a lengthy it was probably seven by 14 you fold it in half so it's seven by seven and you put the single in there then you put the whole thing in a plastic sleeve and then they're ready to go to the store so we sat around my my kitchen table in my apartment in glendale and uh <laughs> and loaded loaded these things up and i and this fits in later you know i always carried a camera and I'm taking pictures of them, you know, and here's Demento holding up a record and here's Al folding <laughs> sleeves and, you know, instead of me working, they're working, right? <laughs> anyway, that was that was kind of the beginning of it. There wasn't a band, really. The, the guys that played on Happy Birthday, and it was a rockin' song. Uh, my brother played on that. He played guitar on that. And uh, 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 the brother of one of Al's writing partners, a guy named Vince Sanchez, his brother, Frank Sanchez, was a bass player. So Frank came. We recorded this in my brother's garage. I hesitate to even call it a studio. It was a, a garage room, and Al brought his four-track Porta Studio cassette four-track recorder in yeah. yep. and set up some yeah. mics, and we just recorded it there. And and that was it. And that's you know that's how that that first thing was done. And in fact, we recorded several more. And and I guess they would be called demos because some of the things got re-recorded for the first album. Happy Birthday got re-recorded, for example. But we did some more things in my brother's garage with my brother on them and i should add that my brother's a pretty well known guitar player uh, in la and and now in nashville for almost 40 years and yeah. uh had worked for many 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 years with neil diamond for many 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 years with mark knopfler wow. and and has done a, an impressive list of studio things the fact that he came and played on this al thing in his own <laughs> place for free was uh was pretty nice of him uh, yeah it's such a, you know, that's the thing, like that LA and especially in those years, the 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 home creation vibe, the the whole Fostex eight tracks, the the Porter Studio, all that stuff allowed a lot of guys to create music and and actually sounding pretty decent, right? Uh yeah. If if it was mic'd well and mixed well and the uh gear sounded good, and meaning you didn't really have to EQ anything, you you didn't really have that option that much. Because yeah. he mixed it right in the he wasn't able to run it through a board to another machine. He mixed everything to the tape and then that was it and whatever yeah. bass and treble you had on the porter studio that was the eq and there yeah. wasn't and there wasn't that much much to do so it was raw there was a lot of energy uh i mean sonically of course it didn't match up to the album but these things all got all these things we did got fed to the dr demento show and he played all of them yeah. uh again al was was and is still uh perhaps the most requested artist on the show this goes back you know 40 plus years yeah, and it's always interesting to me with 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 uh, with Al because you guys have outlasted several artists that you've covered. Oh yeah, which is, which is a really interesting part of that story. How how, so how many decades has this this band? I'm sure you've have you always had the same players, or, or there's been a little bit of right. So you pretty same, much had same guys couldn't find anything better to do uh, for the last <laughs> 40, 44, 42, 40, 40. Well, the the guys. I mean, I I I'm in there since I just happened to play on a recording with Al in 1980. So I go back to September, 1980. Uh, he and I went through 81 and we had a few different people play some gigs with us and stuff like that, but none of them became permanent band. And we didn't have an album out yet. So I don't want to say, I mean, this is all sort of pre first album, first tour starting point really in his career. 
right. if if you don't count any of that and you count the album that was recorded in 1982 and all the gigs after that that we did that's been the same band that's steve j on bass uh a buddy of his jim west on guitar uh me on drums al on accordion occasionally piano you know simple piano parts uh if if needed but I should add that the very first album we did, and there's a story about how that came about, but the very first album we did, uh, Rick Derringer produced it. Right. I and, he, he, and we didn't, Jim West wasn't quite in the loop yet. Steve and I and Al, I, I guess, had already rehearsed those songs. And and Jim was just sort of wandering in as we were about to get into the studio. And uh, Rick was already up to speed on the songs, you know, both as he was going to be producer and I think he'd already been invited to play guitar on it. So basically that first album is me, Steve, Al, and Rick Derringer on guitar, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's a pretty good lineup. <laughs> and, and there's a great story about how Rick, see, everything I say, there's like two or three other things that lead oh, up know, to it yeah. that well, all tell, plays tell, into it. But tell me about Rick. That's I got got to tell you, got to tell you about how Rick came about. Uh, when we recorded one of these uh, demo things, and this was done in in the living room of my, of my house when I lived in Whittier, and Al and a bunch of his demented friends came down, brought the suitcase, and we recorded a song you just written called uh, "I Love Rocky Road" for Joan Jett's "I Love Rock and Roll," yeah, which which was actually not her song. There was a version of that by a group called the Arrows. Of course, you don't know about that because it wasn't a hit. But she had the hit of that. Al was big in, in, in big into doing hits and songs about food was important. So Rocky Road and My Bologna and stuff like eat that. It. Yeah, eat uh, it. Et 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 eat it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Girls just right. want to have lunch. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, in uh, Al had realized that, that uh, in order to do things a little more legally, because one thing had already been turned down, George Harrison, uh, had, had sent a cease and desist when we did Pac-Man for Taxman. And, wow. uh, and he was, he was not thrilled and sent a C and D and, uh, Al realized and, and with his, his manager, who is still our manager, by the way, Jay Levy is, is, uh, I think realized that he had better get a little cooperation from the writers so that there's yeah. not a surprise after the fact. Yeah. Avoid and, lawsuits. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. And that holds true today. Uh, he right. still gets, you know, and there's this question of whether he really needs permission and, you know, to do it, you know, as long as he pays, you know, the, the royalty, because he's right, using their, their music, yeah. uh, you know, does it's, he really it's nice, need... but it's nice if you have them yeah. on board <laughs> and, and, and it's, it's, it's important. It's important. Yeah. So they can't really say anything. If they've agreed to it, they can't really bad mouth you for it. Like, uh, Billy Ray Cyrus did. Oh, wait, <laughs> he did, but he didn't write that song. He didn't write achy breaky heart. So he didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> Al got permission from the writer and turned out, uh, 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 Billy Ray was not that thrilled with the song because it was it was a real poke at Billy Ray and the song. Wow, it was. Yeah. It was. Uh, but it's like, first off, it had already been released, so he was a little late. But it wasn't his song, so it didn't matter. Well, anyway, and, uh, and honestly, I think at that at at the point where you guys have already done like the Michael Jackson stuff and all that, I mean, it's an honor. You would, <laughs> be, you would, I mean, you really, would imagine. You, know, you would imagine. You would so, <laughs> so in in basically in getting permission to broadcast this song, I had to go to. Uh, to a writer of the original I Love Rock and Roll. It was a guy named Jake Hooker. Now, among other things, Jake was married to Liza Minnelli. Uh, but Jake was also Rick Derringer's manager somehow. Ah. So anyway, so in in getting permission for that, Jake said, oh, this is, this is pretty funny. You know, you know uh, I'm sort of familiar with the things you've done. Uh, you know, I maybe we can get some spec time and go into the studio, do this for real. And of course, my client, Rick Derringer, will produce you. Oh, and, wow. And it's like, and Al's like, okay, and and that's <laughs> that's exactly what happened. We wow. got uh, we got some spec time at Cherokee Studios here in L.A. with Rick at the production helm and on guitar, uh, me, Steve, and uh, Al on the rest of the instruments, and we recorded. And again, this is without a contract. This is just to get a bunch of stuff in the can. So we recorded a bunch of stuff. Another one rides the bus was already done, even though it sounded nothing like the Queen version. It was a completely different vibe. Yeah. Now, and in fact, that first album, the, the trademark of, of Al, like copying the production as, as good as possible and the sound of the original songs that he parodied as, as well as possible, hadn't really kicked in at that point. Now, we we played the songs and, you know, but these were all that first album was very accordion based. Right. And it, it was wasn't. Very, it was homegrown vibe. But, but, yeah. that's, but that made it really fun. Well, actually. that that made it unique. But with the second album, and, and this may have been Rick's suggestion, if not Al realizing that it might be even cooler if we could 
go after the original sound right. of the songs and really and uh, so when you hear an intro to a song on the radio you don't really know whose it is until the vocal comes in and so with the second album eat it uh the brady bunch for the safety dance things like that uh we really concentrated on capturing the vibe of of the original recording and we we were okay at that back in you know 1983 for that second album uh we got much better we got really good we got to where you could not tell our version from the other version literally until the vocals came in that's the only way you'd know and uh we're very proud of that we all got into sound design you know as we were chasing the production of hit artists so we had to sort of keep up and while we were a year or two or five behind the curve we all learned to do stuff we all learned to make those right. sounds you know and at that I, point as, too you guys are all over mtv and the production oh, yeah. quality everything's just gone way up right well it was and and, and and which made it even more important you know and i and i can't overstate how important mtv was to us and to a lot of artists in, in the days when they were playing videos, you know, and it's not that videos didn't exist per se. You just didn't have anywhere you could watch them yet. Exactly. And until MTV. So they were, they were still, when our first video came out in, in 83, they were still very fresh and new and played Al. And they, they, the Ricky uh, parody of Tony Basil's Mickey was the first video we did. Uh, that got a lot of airplay. The next one was, I love uh, Rocky road. Uh, got a lot of airplay on that. Basically every video uh, because we were doing things that nobody else was doing. Nobody else was doing fun videos, you know, yet. Exactly. Yeah, you everybody's know, or, trying to be serious. And yeah, their, you know, yeah. Or, or artsy or whatever it was. You right. know, and, and Al was, you know, besides the, the taking a good poke at some of these songs, you know, and, and just having a good time, did some really funny videos. You know, so MTV was, was very, very crucial. But getting back to how Rick Derringer was involved, that's how Rick came into our lives. Now, uh, by 19, you know, by... The gigs we started doing after that first album, Jim West was on guitar. Uh, Rick was signed on as producer for the first six albums. This was, I guess, a lengthy con. Oh, I didn't tell you how we got a contract. We So we recorded the album in uh, 1982, I think March, April, maybe of 1982. And uh, by the end of 82, you know, Al's manager and I think probably Jake and probably Rick uh, helped try to shop it around to all the labels and all the labels said oh this is this is great stuff someone's going to make a million bucks just not us yeah they don't know what to do with it <laughs> right because they, they didn't they did you know it's like comedy this is yeah, not right. stand you're, this, this is not you know a stand-up comedian it's not don rickles what is this you know <laughs> funny music making fun of other music what's what's you know who's going to buy that well scotty brothers records and, and tony and ben scotty were promotion guys who worked with some yeah. of the labels uh they took al on december of 82 signed Al and uh, and uh, began to put out a plan to put out this album. They said, well, you know, the uh, there and there wasn't really a lead single yet. I mean, nothing was really very current. They said, you know, there's nothing current to grab anyone. Can you put together another parody, you know, or, or two or something, something that's more current. So when we put it out, it's it's relevant. Mm -hmm. And that's when Ricky came about. And uh, first album came out, I think it was May of 83. Uh, sold all right. Charted OK. Uh, next album was, uh, and we did a little short tour with Dr. Demento. This was not a Weird Al tour. It was Dr. Demento doing his his show in front of an audience in theaters and stuff like that. And yeah, and show, showing uh, uh, videos, uh, you know, film on film in, in the day and uh, playing stuff that he had to bleep on the radio, you know, playing it, you know, uh, in front of the audience and the audience, the kids are like, oh, you know. Yeah. And, he, had and, he had such a loyal audience. I'm sure. Oh, yeah. They yeah. hate and, that up. <laughs> and they and and we were the live uh performance part of the show. Of course, Al is well known on the short, and we're we're promoting the first album. So we went out with Dr. Demento. Uh it was a northeastern tour. I think we went as far south as uh as Washington, DC. We went up to Toronto. I think we played Cleveland, we did New York City. Uh and and uh so we did about a three-week tour and it went pretty well. Go back in the studio, start recording stuff, I think, in the fall of 83 for the new album uh we had already we had already begun performing eat it sort of a truncated version of eat it in uh in this kind of food medley that we do where where we had thrown together a bunch of al's songs about food and, and just made a medley out of it because we didn't have that much space uh in dr demento's show to do 10 complete food right, songs do everything yeah so we put them together into about a you know 10 11 minute medley so Eat It was already kind of in his mind. We got permission to do that, recorded that. Uh, I think we recorded that in February of 84. No, no, recorded it maybe in, in December of 83. Album came out in February of 84. 
plan plan a new tour again kind of backing up dr demento going out as part of his live show and in the meantime we did i think it was about a four-week tour from february into march and during that time when the album was released now eat it is like going up the charts and now gradually this becomes you know Dr. Demento show with with Weird Al on the side. Now it's yeah, like it's, starting yeah. to become. <laughs> so we go back out in the summer of 84, and now it's just Al. And now we got a bus as opposed to we were driving a camper around. And then we <laughs> first tour, we drove a station wagon and had a Utah for U-Haul for our gear. And sure. uh so by summer of 84, second album, we're on our own. We have a little bit of a crew put together at this point. Uh and again, and it's just it's just the four of us, uh Steve, Jim, me, and Al. Uh, we, you know, and playing this stuff as best we can. Uh, but the production on the records wasn't that complicated. It was not such that we couldn't pull it off as a four piece. Or if we didn't, it's like, well, they sound like a funny bar band or whatever. You know, we weren't. We, <laughs> hey, we, you, the, make, the, you make it work. <laughs> well, yeah, we couldn't. We we really, we probably didn't have or certainly couldn't afford the technology that we got later that allowed us to sound a lot better on stage that allowed us to sync up with Al's video of a song while we're playing it live, yeah. you know, stuff like that. It just, it wasn't available to us. Uh, so, so things progressed after that it, with each new album, there was another tour. Each album sounded better. Each album, uh, I think tended to chart higher. Well, to a point anyway. Uh, so in 3d was the album that came out with eat it. Uh, 1985, we had dare to be stupid. <laughs> uh, which had gir girls just want to have lunch was uh yeah. was uh maybe the single off of that i i i don't remember the single but but dare to be stupid which was an original a devo sounded like was also released as a single why can't i think of the single from dare to be stupid it's probably oh there, there, there's a lot there's a lot of songs <laughs> no no this is no, this is huge how can madonna like right. a surgeon right yeah. that which again huge you know, video and, a great, and a great video too <laughs> yeah gets played all over mtv and in the meantime yeah. mtv is bringing an al to host these two and four hour blocks called al tv yeah. where al plays a bunch of wacky stuff but also plays legitimate videos and he'll he's doctored them he's changed the voice on him he'll talk over it he'll point out <laughs> stupid stuff he'll he'll have himself you know moving in and and doing stuff you know with the artist and then moving back out and and just four hours of just zany whatever. So the, and these were you know big big ratings things for MTV too. I mean they they loved Al right. and Al loved them, uh, yeah. and it just kind of went from there until 1986 Polka Party. Uh, the the single was uh, Living with a Hernia for James Brown's Living in America. James was on Scotty Brothers at the time, so very easy to get permission on that and and you know massage that into place. And right. good video, I thought, good song, funny song, but not it wasn't like a surgeon it wasn't michael jackson you know it was so the fourth album not not so great didn't do so well yeah. it's still you know th almost 40 years later has not gone gold that's one of the two albums that has not even sold 500,000 copies i mean right. it's which that's a cool thing but it's really cool knowing that all of the other albums did and that, you know, that's, that's one of the that's albums the thing, that, right <laughs> so, so we knew it wasn't a hit album then you know the fans told us that basically and and it still it still has not risen it's, it just hasn't gotten there it's it's weird yet, it's very strange yet you guys have kept touring and kept, kept recording and kept you know kept doing it's, it. it's that's the thing that's so interesting about him is that it, well all of you is just a longevity factor it's it's really amazing like you said the same manager the same band yep. um and that's obviously you guys are like a i would assume like a family at this uh, point yeah. early yeah oh, oh very very much so and and part of part of the reason that uh well there's there's two factors i mean one is al maintaining his popularity and part of that is that he's always doing something current in other words the song or the the context of the song is always current uh like for example we did uh uh american pie we did a song called Saga Begins, which American Pie was hopelessly old at that point, but Saga Begins had to do with that that year's Star Wars movies that had just come out. And that was what made it current, right. for example. Uh, yeah, Yoda. The, the tie-in. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yoda, uh, a parody of uh, Kink's Lola from 1970-71, came out yeah. in 79 or, or something like that, or maybe 80. And again, not a current song, but a current theme. You know, yeah. so so that's so Al has stayed current. He's put himself into all sorts of other arenas besides just being a, a humorous songwriter, singer, 
you know, artist. Uh, he's done voiceover stuff. He's done acting things. He's directed videos. He's written some books. Uh, he's He's got a lot of irons in the fire and he's really good at all of them. He's very, very good. So that's that's one. It's great that he's maintained his popularity because that has all that's kept all of us going too. I mean, our careers depend on his career. Now, right. the, the way we've stayed together, uh, I mean, I joke when I say we have nothing better to do, but honestly, I can't think of anything better to do than than to work with him. And all of these other bands I've been in, uh, you know, regardless of what other what level of of uh, you know accomplishment that they they've achieved or or fame or or whatever it is. You know, none of them have, I, I would not give up the Al thing for, for any of them, you know, and, and I never did. And I, I never would. I mean, it would take someone bigger than Al to take me away from Al. And at this point in my life, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in Medicare age. Uh, we all are. Well, you know, exactly. this, it's, it's if, if, you're lucky, if you're lucky, if you're lucky, you get there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, well, I, I guess we're all lucky because we all got there. Al's going to exactly. get there this yeah. year. He'll be, he'll get his Medicare card and he'll go, Oh, I'm old. Wow. <laughs> then, we'll, exactly. then we start calling him old Al Yankovic. <laughs> anyway, yeah. uh, but we we all and we all have other projects we do. But when yeah. Al calls, we we get together and and we do it, and it's because we enjoy it. And of course, he pays us. But I mean, that's we enjoy it more than anything. We we really enjoy it. We enjoy yeah. working with each, with each other. We enjoy working with Al. Uh, he's he's very respectful. Uh, he's very even tempered. Everyone in the organization, crew, everybody is great. If someone's not great, uh, we, we pay them less until they leave, <laughs> or or they're asked to leave. No, no, no. Every, everyone's been everyone's been great, and it's a very you know being on the road for some some people can be grueling. You know, I mean, it can be grueling for kids, let alone people in their sixties and even seventies sure. to go out and you know we were on the road for six months in in twenty twenty two, yeah, in a row, and you know no breaks. 27 weeks actually six it's months in a week does that does that is it interesting for, it must be interesting for you i mean obviously you've had all the hits and the albums but it must be interesting for you now on this side of things just to, to be still working that much um it, it, that must be so i mean plus you're doing it with people that you love um yeah. is that do you have to kind of sometimes you kind of pinch yourself and say wow how did this all happen <laughs> it, it's one of those it's, it's, it's a stroke of luck you know you can't you can't have possibly planned for something like this. You can't engineer it. Like I said, when I met him and I said, I'll be your drummer, here's my phone number. I didn't know what that meant. Yeah. I, did, I thought, you know, oh, oh, just have some fun. This is fun. It's all fun. That's yeah. it. And yeah. it turned it turned into something that that stayed fun and became profitable. Everyone's right. done very well with this. I mean, Al, of course. We've right. all done very, very well working for Al. And and uh, you know, which I'm very happy about and uh you know and very thankful for and very grateful yeah. and not everybody it's not something i could have planned or there's not a career path that you do this and this and this and you wind up at the top otherwise everyone would do it it's just it's not that simple yeah, yeah. does it it doesn't work that way in the arts yeah and i think you know a lot of it too is is um putting yourself in the right place to have opportunities and then then when when they present themselves reaching out and saying hey i'm here and and you know that that's that's a really key thing and i think you know, on that kind of line of thinking, what's some of your advice? I mean, you've learned many things over the years, I'm sure, but what's some of your biggest advice you could relate to other musicians or people that want to be artists? What's some of the most important things that you've actually learned along the way? Well, you know, right place, right time. It's all about right place and right time, but you don't know when that is or where that is. You just, you don't know. Uh, so you have to be a little bit proactive. Uh, networking, I, I cannot overstate how important networking is. And it doesn't mean giving out your phone number or email address to everybody you meet, but it does mean becoming known. In, in this business especially, it's not who you know, it's who knows you. So you got to make sure people know you and have your information and know what you do. And and uh, and I, that doesn't mean sit back and wait for the phone to ring, but to a certain extent, that's that's kind of what happens. And but you have to you have to get out there. You have to network. Uh, social media and a web presence is is extremely important. Uh, I mean, I I've been online uh, since 1993. Yeah, so and that's another big part of your story as well. Being that's being, building websites yeah. and, and but anyways, yeah. So go ahead and continue. <laughs> and, and that's that's very important. And it's not really it's you know it's not enough to just have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram accounts and stuff like that and TikTok. It's not that's not complete because you're subject to their platforms. It's also important to have a dedicated website where you can control the content, where there aren't any ads, uh, 
that's got a different vibe where people can't come in and and hack or crash or or put bad comments on your site you got to have a place where there's good information you know uh, uh wikipedia is not uh, completely reliable i mean yeah. wikipedia is great if they list a website for whoever they're talking about and then you go to the website then you learn about the person you don't learn about them from wikipedia there's so much i've had to go in and correct uh, me i've got a wikipedia page that i did not create and i have to go in and correct it all the time yeah these people always have they think they're doing me a favor and they put in all sorts of information it's like th th this is not right th this is and they say who, who are you to i said i'm this guy this did not happen <laughs> This, this is not correct. I, I was there. <laughs> so somebody else did this. I'm not trying to put stuff in here that's incorrect. I'm just I want it to be correct. I, I really do. That's why I'm fixing it. Anyway, uh, but but having having a presence out there uh, on the internet is is extremely important, and that's part of networking as well. Having examples of your playing, uh, having photographs if you've got if you've got uh, videos of yourself playing, that's great. Uh, write a compelling bio. I mean, there's there's all sorts of ways to put your information out there. And through other networking means, you have people people stumble stumble across it, like I stumble on those words. Uh, there's ways, and this is again, I I know how to do this because I learned coding in 1995. Uh, right. I can make a page that will come up in the top results of uh, Google. And I remember when I remember when there was no Google, there was uh, Yahoo, there were all these yeah. other search <laughs> engines, and I knew, and they were each a little bit different, but I knew how to deal with them. But now it's yeah. all Google, and you have to have you you have to be able to tell, have your page come up in different results. I've got my page. If you go to Google and you type in my name, both names incorrectly spelled, and and just put drums, I guarantee you I'm in the top one or two yeah, results because I put those better. I put those misspellings in there. Swartz, shorts, Swartz with a Z, <laughs> John with yeah. an H, Johnny with a with an H, Johnny without an H, Johnny with one N. Yeah, you know? and that's so that's so smart to do that. Right. It's yeah. well a lot and a lot of people don't think about it. So basically I'm very easy, you know, it's like, oh the, I heard about this guy Bermuda Schwartz or John Schwartz or whatever he goes by. We'll just type it in and you know, John Schwartz, yeah. J O N Schwartz, yeah, S S H O R T Z, right? And I'll come up, I'm at the top. Yeah. And yeah. and so there's there's things like so it's important to do it right. It's not just oh, I'll put up a page with some pictures and people will somehow find it. You have to yeah. You have to make it findable and it can be done. It's very easy to do. Yeah. That's part of the business because the thing is people like, you know, there's a lot of really talented people, people that we, we all know, but they did, they just never got to that other level because they, maybe the business thing wasn't together or they didn't know how to go out and meet people and give their number and just do the basic stuff. But that's, I, you know, that's something with me growing okay. up in LA and I'm sure you experienced this that you learn that really quickly if you want to work in yeah. LA. Yeah. Well, I, but you know what? Not everybody, gets discovered right i mean that's it's true. just yeah it's it's just not uh now one one thing that's also happening again and this is where youtube has become very important uh people that can play their butts off will whether it's technically or whether they're just great groovers they can put that stuff on youtube for free right and if you could just drive people to see it somehow and again this is important you got to it's who knows you it's how do you get people to to come yeah. find out about you but you can put examples of that stuff up there and and uh People will know immediately, you know, and some guys overplay and it's like, God bless them. That way I got, I can work forever because these guys play the way they <laughs> That's do. That's exactly the way I think. <laughs> I, I am so glad. I'm very happy for these guys and they're incredible technicians. And it's yeah. like, they're never, ever, ever going to get my gig. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. And and they probably aren't smart enough to know that they would want my gig because they just, that's their mind is somewhere else. And that's, right. there's room for players like that. I mean, I, yeah, I, it's I, all good. Yeah. But but not that many, and not in the mainstream, and not in Al's band, and not in any of the bands. I I was never ever ever thrown out of a band. I was never thrown out of a band, but I was never at you know asked to rise to a certain technical level. Yeah. I was always where I needed to be. I never had to go beyond because that's not what most band what ninety nine percent of the bands do. Yeah, and I and I'm actually right there with you because I always think and I, and I you know it's fun to watch. I mean, there's so many great players, technical players, and that kind of thing. But I've always you know, I did like Frankie Avalon and Gary Puckett, and that's me mm. potatoes bass. But yeah. I like doing I like playing bass. I like playing that, and I can do the solo stuff. But I've never been hired when they asked me if I could solo. <laughs> that was never yeah. that was never a thing. So that which is fine. It's all good. Um, yeah. How so? Speaking of websites, what what is actually your website? How can people find you? Uh, uh, it's bermudaschwartz.com, S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z, or awesome, bermudaschwartz.net, or bermudaschwartz.org, or, <laughs> yeah. 
Anyway, I, I, I nabbed I nabbed all of those long you ago. You bought all of them. Good, yeah. awesome. Uh, and, and that's that's got uh, uh, it's basically got all of my information. It's got my email. It's got uh, uh, photos of me. It's got uh, a, a resume, a list of all the credits. It's got links to uh, articles and podcasts. Uh, this will be on there, uh, awesome. and uh, uh, it's got links to all of the companies uh, that I endorse, who I'm involved with. Uh, some other mis- it's just it's it's all about me, which is what it's supposed to be, yeah. uh, and that's that's where you find that. And it's not interactive; it's you go there and you read about me, and it's you know you click on this and you know you go to another site or whatever it is, but you find yeah. out about me there. Now for interactivity, uh, for for a dynamic with the people I know and other musicians, that's what I use Facebook for. Uh, I'm on Twitter and Instagram. I I rarely use them. Uh, my Facebook uh, handle is Bermuda Schwartz. And uh, I think it's literally facebook.com slash Bermuda Schwartz would get you there. Yeah. And that's how we actually met. And I just basically messaged. We've messaged a few times over the years. And and uh, it's such a great story. I'm so I'm happy for you and, and the band. Oh, and you. I know how I know how rare that is. And I've always enjoyed what you guys do. Um, so it's such a pleasure to, to kind of hear the story fleshed out because like you said there's a lot of little rumors here and there about how this happened yeah. how that happened so it's fun to, to fun to get the real story from the guy that was there <laughs> uh, i i should i should add that that now i believe there is only one other band that has been together longer than we have with its original members and they're still active right and that's that's you too ah okay awesome. that's it uh zz top sadly is gone by the wayside yeah. uh rush and and Neil Peart wasn't the original drummer, but even if you say he was, they are no more. Uh, yeah. They felt they fell off the list. Uh, I don't remember if there are any others. I don't think it's, so. It's you yeah. two and us, and you two's yeah. got us beat by a few years, and as as they should. It's a rare story, man. So, you know, uh, it's awesome to talk with you and and get a chance oh, to, to to learn some really great information. Um, everybody, please check out Bermuda on his website. All the other places, as you said, he's easy to find. And the other thing I should mention is you're actually Weird Al's archivist, which is also great. Uh, hoarder, archivist, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, it's, but it's, that's that's important though, right? Well, it became important uh, for for a lot of reasons, but I I'd always just been that way. It's not like. I suddenly realized, oh, this weird owl is going to be big and I better start grabbing stuff because someday I'm going to, you know, take it to the thrift store or something. Yeah. Uh, I had always documented and kept and recorded and done everything all the way back to about 1970, 71. You know, I still have reel to reel tapes of musicians I played with rehearsing in my living room at home. That's awesome. Yeah. And I still have those. I mean, you know, now they've been digitized, but I, I kept all of that stuff, you know, flyers for bands I played in, photos. I always took photos. I, I had a dark room at home when I was a teenager. Yeah. Uh, I'll, always took photos. And and the, the archiving aspect with Al just sort of, that was just an extension of it. There just was more cool things to archive with him, yeah. like cassettes and lps and cds and videos and you know books and posters and costumes and merchandise that we sold on tour and there's just a whole bunch of stuff that's cool to file away and basically give back to al one of these days yeah. but the the archiving has has come in handy uh some years ago uh, uh the label wanted to put out a video compilation and al wanted to put together some notes about the videos, you know, little, little information about the videos, you know, like the dates we recorded them. I said, you, you and your manager directed them. Don't you know? What? No, you, you got, you've got that all in one place. Don't you? I said, yeah, I do. Okay. Well, we recorded this video on these two days at this place. And this was the director, you know, we had a couple of directors before Jay became the director and then Al became the director. Uh, and I, I had all of that information for them. I had all of the information when Al said, how, how many performance, how many live performances have we done? as a band in the in the album the touring years you know and, and uh and so we've done uh uh 1900 and and uh you know 72 he says so we're not at 2000 yet i said no not yet he says okay just just checking i don't know what that means i don't know if he's going to try and stop at 2000 <laughs> but we had we had some fans try and celebrate our 1000th show and it's well is that 1000 dates that we played because sometimes we do two different shows on a day Right. Uh, yeah. You know, and and sometimes, you know, it, it's important to know, you know, there's a difference between a show and a show day. And yeah. and they also didn't know exactly when when to start. And they may not have had a complete list, although I keep a complete list on the website. Uh, so Al relied on me for that. And it turns out it wasn't quite where the fans thought it was. That wasn't quite a thousand shows. 
Uh, <laughs> I didn't have the heart to tell him, but I just, I said, Al, you know, they, you got all these notes, you know, congratulations on your thousandth show. I said, uh, no, not, not quite, not really. Actually, I think I mean, we had already achieved a thousand. We had already passed that landmark. Yeah, but, probably, uh, but at this point, it probably feels like a million. <laughs> it, it does, and but that's okay. I, yeah, I've enjoyed, that's I've enjoyed yeah. every one of them. Uh, and then the, the rest of the archiving, you know, uh, and when I say photographs, uh, I ended up putting out two books, two photo books of right. Al. Yeah. And uh, the first book was uh, actually a bunch of photos nobody had seen. It was a black and white book uh, called Black and White and Weird All Over. And this came out in uh, 2020. And uh, of course, I ran everything by Al and not like, well, he hadn't seen most of these photos. So I had to run them by Al. These were yeah. all, none of them had been printed. They were just all oh. on contact sheets in a file cabinet. So I ran all of those by Al. If there was another guy in the band in the photo or if Al's manager was in the photo, because I, I would take uh, shoot photos on the video sets. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, other people would be in there. I'd run them by him. He was just, this okay. I want to see about getting this published. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, all good. Uh, and that book did very, very, very well. We did a box set with some special extra feature, extra stuff and, you know, photos. Uh, awesome. Frameable. Anyway, book did very, very well. Put out a second book, came out in uh, late 2022, uh, called uh, Lights, Action. No, no. Second book in 2022 called Lights, Camera, Accordion. <laughs> I wish I could tell you I came up with, with the names for either of these books, but I didn't. Uh, anyway, the, and that's, these were all color and a lot of these photos have been seen, but they were on the web and back in the day in the nineties and the, and the two thousands, uh, because of screen resolution and bandwidth and all that, they were, they were small. Some of these yeah. photos were 320 by 240. I mean, they're this big, right? you know, which, which on a 640 by 480 screen that filled up 25% of the screen. That was pretty cool. <laughs> and, but they were, they were ridiculously small photos. Anyway, some, you know, several of those got reprinted. These are all from the negatives now. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and got reprinted on nice big pages, nice and clear. You, you, you know, the old photos were taken from prints, so they weren't really full frame. So now you're seeing, you know, color corrected, density corrected, crystal clear photos in a great all color book spanning 25 years. And that book has, has done uh, pretty well. Second, you know, sequels don't always do as well as the first book. So the second book is sold about half as well as the first, which is great. That's that's yeah. good for me. Well, I'm sure it means a lot to the fans to have that material. I'm I'm actually I'm a Getty photographer as well. That's one of my ten jobs. So I'm yeah. the same. I'm the same guy. I'm there taking photos of rehearsals and all that. Uh, and yeah. People don't, yeah. they don't think about that. I'm like, no, you got to get that stuff. Is important. It's oh, good yeah. to have. You know. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, I I did that at a time. Well, first off, Al, I just always had a camera with me. I didn't happen to have one with me that first night I met Al. Uh, I just. Not that I wasn't carrying a camera. Though. I just didn't bring one that day. But the next yeah. time I saw him and we got together to record Happy Birthday, I had my camera there. Awesome. And and almost every other time we were together, all the time on tour, in the studio, on video sets, and nobody thought to tell me, you know, and, and I wasn't always in the videos full time. So I'm standing around a lot with a lot of time behind the scenes, shooting pictures, and you can see the crew and the camera and the person yeah. with the clapboard and stuff. And I've got all of that stuff in there because... I, I'm available to shoot it. And Al and his manager just, well, he's just, he's always has a camera. That's just what he does. Yeah. You know, that's awesome. and, yeah. and, then, and then anybody there from the crew, it's like, well, he's, he's Al's guy. I guess he's okay. So nobody ever questioned me and I'm just shooting away. I'm getting in people's faces. And just, as long as I'm not in the way of the camera, <laughs> I'm just clicking away. And, and that was the bulk of, of the first book were yeah. a bunch of, bunch of shots from videos that nobody had ever seen. They've seen the videos. They had just not ever seen these these pictures. Certainly not the behind the scenes stuff. I mean, when I mean, they're all behind the scenes, really. Yeah, uh, and well, I'd that's, say that's that's just, that's sort of having like the VIP access to the yeah you know, that and that's that's super exciting. I'm I'm sure the fans just absolutely love that. Oh, well, they did, and and I love that they love that, and I love the books too. I mean, really, that's very cool for him to have them in his possession because now he's got yeah. like nice copies of. Those. Now, I sent him all of the files. I mean, he certainly has got high res files of everything, but it's yeah. very cool for him to have a book. You know, on his coffee table, you know, and people come over, and they look at it, and it's a book, and it's him, and it's, yeah, which is, that's but that's okay. I mean, it's that's it's him. That's yeah, I'd like to have. I'd like to have a book about me. That'd be right. Cool. Yeah, we, we we should all have a book about ourselves. Uh, hey, Bermuda, thank you so much for your time. I super oh, appreciate it. You're and, welcome, Daryl. Um, thank you. We, we will put all your information on the uh, podcast posting with your website, all the social addresses, and and all that. Um, and you guys have, I'm sure you're always doing shows. You're you're in the studio recording. So if everybody wants to check out your calendar, it's you always have it on your website, correct? Well, the the uh, 
the way to find out what Al's doing specifically is go to his website. Okay. And that's uh, weirdal.com. Right. And I was, I was smart 30, uh, 30 plus years ago, whatever it was. I got W E I R D of course, which is, and I got W I E R D A L.com. <laughs> So no matter no matter how how badly you spell it, if you don't exactly. get the I, if you don't get the e before i thing of weird, right. you'll still get you'll still get there. He's got he will always have upcoming schedules, upcoming news, things like that. Awesome. Uh, we're gonna we're we're not touring this year, uh, 2024, but we we should be on the road in 2025. Uh, where I think we're gonna have some new things to play. I think uh, Al wants to put something new out this year. Awesome. And and uh, uh, weirdal.com is probably. The best place to get that. If you want to know just about me, uh, it's uh, BermudaSchwartz.com. If you want to know about what gigs and stuff I've got coming up, I, I sometimes put those things on Facebook. And again, it's Facebook.com slash BermudaSchwartz. Awesome. And uh, again, e easy to find. Or, you know, uh, email. People can message or email me. I mean, it's not, you know, my, my access has been out there for many, 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 many years. Unlike a lot of other... I guess celebrity drummers that you can't get a hold of. I've just right. always been online. I've always been accessible, and that's uh, you know. And I'm part of the Al fan community as as you know, as as one of them because I've just yeah. always you know been there to talk to because they can't always get a, a hold of Al directly, of course. Right. Uh, and I'm I'm just uh, you know, and I love the fans. I mean, if it weren't for the fans, none of us would be doing this. Exactly. That's exactly right. Thank you so much. Awesome. Have a great day. Hopefully I'll get a chance to see you guys live when you get out on the road. <laughs> uh, hopefully next year. Yeah. Awesome. Have a great day, Bermuda. Thanks, Daryl. Thank you so much.